So I'm Stephen Gould. I'm the owner, lead distiller, master distiller, whatever you want to call it, at Golden Moon Distillery. Uh, I've been distilling off and on for 28 years, give or take. Um, I'm also the master distiller at a large whiskey operation up in Ireland. I do that part time. Uh, and then I handle government affairs for the uh, distillers of Colorado, the Colorado Distillers Guild. And so I'm going to start by saying on behalf of the Colorado Distillers Guild, welcome to Colorado. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about, about history of distilling in Colorado and what's going on in our state today. Um, it's a pretty dynamic distilling community. It's one of the largest distilling communities in the United States. And people have been distilling off and on in Colorado literally as long as Europeans have been in North America. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about Spanish Colorado because obviously the first Europeans to come into Colorado uh, were the Spanish conquistadores. Um, distilled spirits in the Old West, booze in Colorado in the late 1800s, prohibition in Colorado, and then we're going to talk about what's going on here in Colorado today. So the Spanish brought distillers or apothecaries that distilled for medicinal purposes into the new world when they, and when they came here. So early in the 16th century you saw apothecaries bringing small alembics with them into Mexico and then up into new, what is now New Mexico and now Colorado uh, to make medicinal substances. Now the other thing that happened during the 16th century was we see the first gin recipes showing up in Europe. And those recipes were, again, medicinal. We have wild juniper everywhere. We know the Spanish used juniper for medicinal purposes. We know they were distilling. It's logical to assume that we don't have any hard evidence that they were using juniper the way the Dutch were using because the Dutch started using it 20, 30, 40, 50 years before, probably a lot earlier than that, but that's the earliest documentation we have. So it's very likely that the first distillates that were actually made in what is now Colorado, actually were something akin to a, 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 an early gin. They certainly were botanical distillates. So what this shows is it shows a map of where the Spanish were um, between 1535 and 1800. And as you can see, Colorado is about here. Okay? So we were definitely in Spanish territory. And what you had was you had Conquistadore exploration uh, missions running all over looking for wealth for the Spanish Empire. But at the same time, we know, even though there's not a lot of documentation, there are archaeological sites where we know there were Spanish mining colonies all throughout southern Colorado. And that's where we probably had apothecaries that were set in place that were running stills. We know there because it, we've got examples of them that the, the main trading center in Santa Fe, New Mexico had apothecaries and there are examples of both glass and ceramic stills that were used in the mid 1500s in Santa Fe. So it's logical when they were, when they were putting people in place you know, a few hundred miles away that they would bring an apothecary with them to keep at least the wealthy elite uh, of the group healthy. So this shows a map in 1797. Um, if you look again, you can see real close, this is about where we are. And this is the Spanish map of this part of the, uh, of the world. Um, again, the Spaniards were all over here, so. Moving forward, U.S. takes over this part of the country, the United States. Uh, gold rush happens. And what we start to see is initially spirits coming from the East Coast, coming from Europe, usually in bulk. But then people start building stills. You know, it's the way it is. Uh, they've been cultivating grains like barley and rye in Colorado since the, uh, the early 1800s. And they've been cultivating sugar beet since the early 1800s. And we know that all of those were used here in Colorado historically to make spirits, some good, some not so good. Um, as it says, point two, locally produced. Um, very often you would find, and we have lots of records of this, where people would make a beet spirit and then they would use creosote and other chemicals to disguise it and pass it off as a whiskey. And so you found a lot of that in your mining towns and your, and your cattle towns uh, out on the frontier. You'd often also get young spirit that was brought in. You'd get some young spirit that was made here. 
Um, one of the other things that we tend to see, we talk about modification, etc., but we also see a large Germanic population moving in to, to several different areas of the state of Colorado and bringing with them the technology of brewing. And so we start to see more barley being grown uh, and we start to see some of that barley finding its way into stills. We also start to see evidence of low volume production of fruit distillates, just like you would have seen in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, but the bulk of it, again, was, was typically lower quality spirit. It was then very rapidly, uh, we'll call it modified, using less than great techniques to get products on the market for the, for the, the miners, for the people that were moving west. So 1862, we've got the Civil War going on. They're starting to build the railroads across the country. The capital of the, of, of the territory of Colorado at this point is, is the, the modern city of Golden, where my distillery happens to be based. Denver at this point was, the, was a burgeoning rail and, and, and trading hub, but was not yet the capital of the, of the state, and the state wasn't yet a state. Um, the liquor tax of 1862 is hugely important because the union, in order to help fund the Civil War, enacted an excise tax. Now, it was roughly the same structure as the whiskey, uh, the whiskey tax that Hamilton enacted uh, at the start of our country, which led to the Whiskey Rebellion. It was almost a carbon copy. And what they did was they started by taxing 15 cents a proof gallon on spirits produced anywhere in the Union. By the end of the war in 1865, that had gone up to $2 a proof gallon, which in, in real money in 1865 is, is, is an astronomical sum. So what that led to was a burgeoning uh, illicit booze manufacturing trade across Colorado and, of course, elsewhere in the U.S. And there were several areas of production which, which became very, very well known 20, 30, 40 years later during Prohibition. Uh, one of them was Gilpin County, Golden Gate Canyon, directly above where I live. Another was uh, the mining city of Leadville. Um, Casper, Wyoming, which is just up the road, was another one. Um, and there were three or four others around the state of Colorado as well. And so what you, what you had in Colorado was a moonshining and organized crime issue like the, most of the country saw in Prohibition, but starting much, much earlier. So there was a gentleman by the name of Julius Kessler. He was a Hungarian immigrant. And so he moved to the city of Leadville, and he started distilling, and would, would literally sell his whiskey uh, out of a backpack in mining camps when he started. Then he moved to driving around with a, with a, with a wagon, and he eventually became pretty big. Uh, he owned breweries and distilleries uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, became one of the most wealthy men in Colorado because he sold whiskey. Uh, ended up selling uh, his business uh, in the 1930s and retiring back to Hungary where he bought a castle and that's the end of that story. Except that it shows that <clears throat> because he started literally as an illicit producer, uh, it shows that lots of whiskey was being produced not down here on the edge between the mountain and the plains where we're standing today, but actually up in the high country. I mean, Leadville is, is over 10,000 feet. And for a, a person to build what became a national brand out of a little mining town in the high Rockies is pretty cool. The brand actually still exists today. You can still buy it. Beam Suntry owns it. It's made in Kentucky now. <laughs> But so there's a little piece of Colorado history that's still out there floating around. The thing I'd like to do with this slide, so this is Shaney's Chicago Bar. Shaney's Chicago Bar is the, it was the first destination bar in Colorado. It was founded in the 1850s and you know, it was in the capital of the territory, Golden. Uh, this building doesn't exist anymore, but w the location is oh, half a block from where my tasting room is. And I'm getting ready to build a new tasting room in, the, in, in what is now next door to this location. Um, what's cool about this particular bar is I've got the menu. And as you can see, the menu's on this slide. And it's fascinating to look at what they were serving as far as cocktails. And you'll notice gin cocktails, they've got a gin sling, 
Um, there's a lot of things we kind of recognize there. Now, this bar was, was known for having, quote, a long bar with a South Sea Island feel. So what that means, to extrapolate a little bit, is that the first really famous bar in Colorado was actually a pre-tiki-tiki -tiki bar. And this is it. So, but they were serving gin drinks, including a gin sling, which is one of the oldest tiki style or pre-tiki style cocktails. So gin and gin cocktails have been around in this state for a long time. Next, we have Prohibition. Now, Prohibition was a wild time here in Colorado. Uh, it, we had as large a organized crime problem as anywhere in, in, in the country. We had mob wars that rivaled those in Chicago, but because we're out in the Wild West, they didn't get the reporting that the mob wars in Chicago and New York got. We had buildings being blown up. We had full-blown shooting matches with dozens of men on each side between the police, the revenuers, and what were, in many cases, Italian mafioso families with ties to Sicily. So everything you see in the, in, about the prohibition bootlegger mob stuff in TV shows like, Board, like uh, Boardwalk Empire or et cetera. We had our own Western version of that going on right here in Colorado. And so these are actually stills that were seized uh, circa 1920. Um, this still was actually seized in Golden, Colorado, where my distillery is, about two blocks from my tasting room where it was being run underneath house. And this still was still in the possession of the county sheriff as recently as 1985. And no one in the sheriff's office can tell me where it went. They moved offices and it disappeared. So for all I know, some former sheriff's officers moonshine in his backyard with this old still. This is actually um, uh, illicit booze that came out of Kansas. It was seized outside of Denver, right outside here. Um, they were, it was being produced in a distillery for medicinal purposes, but being sold out the back door. Um, these trucks were bringing it to Denver to, to use in Denver speakeasies, and they got caught. And this actually came from the Denver Post. And these are, this is a picture of a still, and that cabin still exists. So this is in uh, Golden Gate Canyon uh, in Gilpin County. Um, so where my house is is at, is, is at the, the base of Golden Gate Canyon. Literally, if you drive from the street that's the nearest cross street to my house due west for about 12 miles, just follow that street up, you'll get to right where this cabin is. And it's now Golden Gate Canyon State Park. And people regularly, about it, once every two or three years, will still find dilapidated cabins with stills in them or stills buried or, or under bushes. And, you know, it's, it's funny, the rangers go, yes, yeah, somebody brought in another still. There's little teeny stills elsewhere. But what's amazing to me is we have records during early and mid -pro the prohibition period of distilleries operating in what is now the state park that literally had 100 to 200 employees and were running massive shade tree operations that were producing huge volumes of distillate. Now, what's also really interesting about what was produced in Golden and Golden Gate Canyon, as opposed to elsewhere in the state, is most of the moonshine that was produced in Colorado and, and the surrounding areas during Prohibition was beet sugar spirit that was then adultered or modified to become a gin or a whiskey or whatever. Uh, that was not the case in, 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 in the part of the state that my distillery is in. We had a large brewing community. We had multiple breweries, uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of German, predominantly German uh, immigrants that brought that technology with them. We had ready access to uh, malt, to barley, and juniper grows everywhere. So we have evidence that they were using um, local wildcrafted juniper, brewer's hops, and barley to make gin in Golden during Prohibition. It was pretty damn good quality gin from what I've read. So much so that, that when you would walk into a speakeasy here in Denver, if you wanted the premium juice, what you would ask for is Golden Moon or Leadville Moon or Casper Moon. And yes, that is where the name of my distillery comes from. Next, what we're doing today here in Colorado. 
So as of three weeks ago, which is the last time I, I, I looked at the numbers, uh, we have 103 licensed tax paying operating distilled spirits plants in the state of Colorado. Those are the state's numbers that are actually tracking revenue. It's the federal numbers are notoriously inaccurate. Um, our guild, which we believe is the largest guild in the country, has today, or has yesterday, I haven't looked this morning, um, 68 dues paying members, making us from what we believe the, the largest state distillers guild. We have the Colorado Spirits Trail. We're in our second year of this trail. We have 61 distilleries that you can visit on the Colorado Spirits Trail. If you go to all of them, you will get entered into a drawing to win a bottle of booze from all of them. We're going to give out four of those this year. We gave out four of those last year. If you go to 10 of them and get your little map and get it stamped, then you get a t-shirt. So if anyone's feeling like doing a road trip, we highly encourage it. And I will tell you, we launched this last year and literally within two weeks of launching it, we had 56 distilleries on our trail last year. We had two people that had taken time off work and had gone to every one of the 56 distilleries. And those two people along with two others will get a bottle of booze from every one of those distilleries at a party we're throwing next month. So basically they outfitted their bar. But it took them two weeks off work and driving probably a couple thousand miles when you add it all up to do it. But it's great fun if you want to do it. And all of us here in Colorado love visitors. So, so now let's look at, look at what we're doing in Colorado, what, what we distillers in Colorado are doing. So we actually went out and we surveyed all 68 members of the Colorado Distillers Guild. There are other distilleries that aren't members, so we don't have access to them. But we put out a gin survey, and we looked at what is going on here in the state of Colorado. And 35 of our, of our members, so a little over half, responded. Now, we did it in the last week. Um, it's still open. I may get some more numbers. But what we saw in those 35 responses is that 94.3%, or all but two of the respondents, are making gin. Now, we do have a number of distilleries that are whiskey dedicated or, or rum dedicated or et cetera, and they don't make a gin. But the bulk of our distilleries here in Colorado produce at least one, if not more, gins. If you extrapolate that, what that means is that we have somewhere around 97 and 99 gin producers in the state of Colorado. The reality is it's probably plus or minus five, the real numbers, but that's a lot of gin brands in the state of Colorado. The people that are producing gin, obviously there's the two distilleries that responded, uh, and if I were a betting man, um, it's 291, which is a whiskey shop, and Montagna, which is a rum shop that said they don't make gin, but took the time to respond. Um, obviously, 34.3% are making a single gin as part of their product line. 3%, uh, I don't know why we've got two ones there. All right, so we're about 37% have one gin as their product line. Uh, two gins, we've got over 14% of our of, of respondents. Um, three gins, we have another 26% uh, are making three gins. And here's where it gets a little interesting. Four gins, so we've got over 11% of our respondents that make four gins in their product line. There's one company that's making five gins in truth and advertising, that's me. Um, and then there's one company that is making eight different gins that responded to this. So not only are there a lot of gin brands, potentially almost 100 producers of gin in the state of Colorado, but a lot of the gin brands in the state of Colorado are producing more than one gin. So the next question is, what kind of gins are being produced in Colorado? 11% say they're producing a London dry gin. 8.6% say they're producing an Old Tom. Western New World, that's sort of a catch-all for, hey, we're doing something we think is different. 82.9%, uh, that's almost everybody, says we're doing something we think is different from mainstream gin styles. Navy strength, 11.4%. Cash condition, this is an interesting number. Almost one in three gin producers in the state of Colorado have a cash condition product of some sort, including myself. 
other, which is, which is sort of a weird catch-all. I will tell you my, my primary gin is in the other category. But five producers, so 14.3%, say that their gins do not fall into any style whatsoever that has been identified. Um, interesting that two people that say they produce gin say they have no style. Um, we, we have a pink gin. I don't know who's producing it, but if you're following the world gin market, pink gins are becoming popular. And so we have one producer of a pink gin already in Colorado. We have a Bavarian gin. We have a big gin. And then we have one that has nothing. So there's a lot of diversity in what's going on and a lot of cre creativity and experimentation with what our large community of distillers are producing as far as gin here in Colorado. So the next question then is, is gin your primary product? And I find this one fascinating. Almost every producer of spirits in Colorado has a gin, but only one in four that responded to the survey say it's their primary product. Most of them are whiskeys, some are rums, but, or some are just very diverse portfolios where they don't have a primary product. But what we're seeing here is we're not seeing, as a rule, dedicated gin producers. We're seeing distilleries that produce families of spirits where gin is part of that, those families of spirits, which is different than what you see in, in many other places in the world. So what's everybody else producing? Now, this is sort of a catch-all list. It's hard to read. I apologize. Um, obviously, vodka, 74.3% of respondents say they're producing vodka. We all know that vodka is, is the first thing that many distilleries produce because you strip the hell out of any fermentable, you rectify the heck out of it, you put it in a bottle, and let's face it, it's one of the top selling spirits in the country. You're going to make some cash flow off of it. Um, next is rum. Uh, one third of our producers in Colorado are producing rum. Uh, bourbon, so two thirds, give or take, of our producers in the state are producing bourbon of some sort. Um, malt whiskey. Almost two thirds of, of the producers in the state have some sort of a malt whiskey product that they're producing. Well, we're a beer state. There's lots of barley around here. It makes total sense. Um, rye whiskey. A little over half of the distilleries in Colorado are producing rye at some sort. Uh, and some of those, I will tell you, are using malted rye as opposed to making a traditional rye whiskey. There's lots of ways to slice this, but there's a lot of different things going on in the rye space, some of which are really exciting. Um, in fact, one of our distilleries here in Colorado, their rye whiskey was named the top rye whiskey in the world at the World, uh, the world Whiskey Awards last year. Pretty cool. And that's not me, by the way. It's 291. 20% um, give or take, wheat whiskey. We have five absent producers. I'm one of those. My neighbor Sean's one of those. Todd Leopold is, is one of those. Um, all of us produce gin as well. Um, the reason that's kind of cool is gin and absinthe historically are very similar. They both came out of the medicinal world and the historical recipes often overlap by as much as 70 to 80 percent of the botanicals. So the fact that you, you've got five producers in one state making an absinthe I think is cool. But I'm an absinthe guy, so. 20% um, are making brandy, 8.6% are making agave spirits. Um, you've got brandy, you've got eau de vie. So those really should be one category, not two. Uh, so we have another 11.4%. Um, uh, so between brandy and eau de vie, that's one third of the respondents to this are making, are, are making some sort of a brandy. Um, less than 10% are making uh, what are called liqueurs. Uh, but then you've got someone that's making a white whiskey liqueur. You've got an aquavit or a bitter. And so they've broken down, these are a lot of other categories that probably should be buried in the bigger numbers up front. And as you can see, all of these are typically one respondent. So I'm not gonna go through all of those. The point being is that while there's a lot of people producing gin here in Colorado, we're producing a huge amount of other types and styles of spirit. And in most cases, our distilleries are producing these all at the same time. And here is what I think is one of the coolest slides. So obviously, I'm, I'm not really sure where the data glitch is on somebody not selling in Colorado when they're producing in Colorado. but. There was one respondent that said they're not selling in Colorado, but they're producing in Colorado. 
Um, so pretty much everybody is selling here in the state, which makes total sense. But over half our distilleries are, are distributing in other states. And one out of five distilleries, if you extrapolate this data across the whole population, are exporting outside the United States. I think that's huge, because that means that Colorado has a global reach. I mean, I was just in Japan, I saw Colorado products on bars, and I was actually in Japan meeting with importers talking about putting my, my products on their bars. Speaking as one of those, those exporters, I'm in multiple countries in Europe, and then through my relationship with a company in England called the uh, Boutique Gin Company, uh, I've got gin in Japan, Finland, and uh, South Africa through them as well. So, and, that, and, and I'm not alone in that. There's, there's well, as you can see, you know, 20% of us are exporting. So I think that's incredibly cool. It's helping the U.S. economy. It's helping the Colorado economy. And it's only going to get better from here, assuming that we can get through this trade war we're in the middle of. And all of us are feeling a little bit of pain with that tra trade war. Every one of us that's exporting has seen our sales drop in the last 18 months. But I think that's temporary. I mean, I'm still spending a lot of time and resources Many of the, the other distillers, all the exporters, exporting distillers in the state, we work together, we communicate, we give each other advice. You know, and that's, I think that's probably the, the, the last really important point, is that at least here in Colorado, at least with the, with the 68 distilleries that are in the guild, we are a community. We work together, we help each other out, we do not view each other as competitors. We view each other as, as compatriots, and we believe that a rising tide raises all boats. And that's what I got. Any questions about Colorado? Do you have any idea of the export, how much of that goes to Canada? I don't. Um, Canada is difficult because Canada is sort of like our control states, only worse. Um, I've been in discussions personally with, with importers in three provinces in Canada for the last two years and have never been able to get through the roadblocks and actually get enough interest to where it makes business sense for these people to bring the stuff in. You know, everything is through a provincial store and every province has a different set of regulations. Um, like I said, it's like our control states, only maybe a little more bureaucratic. Any other questions? Great, well thank you for listening to me. I hope you found it enjoyable. <laughs>